Welcome to the July 2018 presentation of the Association of Information, Information Technology Professionals, North Central Florida chapter. We have with us tonight, well, first of all, my name is Michael Lucas. I'm the immediate past president, current secretary, and have held most of the roles in the chapter over the years. So I'm currently serving as the head of the nominations committee. More on that in just a second. Our presentation tonight is going to feature Don Pazette of IT Pro TV, and he's going to be giving us a very interesting insight called Tales from the Field, Mitigating a Distributed Denial of Service Attack. I'm going to speak about that very briefly. Uh, denial of service attacks can be launched almost against almost any web service. Um, they are not expensive to launch and they can cause a great deal of trouble for those who are the victims. And Don's gonna go over, well, he'll review his own presentation in just a moment. Um, mentioned the nomination committee, um, and when we did the transition into CompTIA-AITP, Comp we established ourselves as a provisional board and our time as a provisional board is expiring, so we are getting ready to nominate our slate of um, executive board members for the year 2019. The positions include president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and two directors. If you're interested, and I'm declaring as of now, the nominations are now open. The floor is open for nominations and will be until, and we'll send this information out in an email as well. For this is for our members specifically, of course. Um, if you're interested in nominating someone right now, the address to send the email, to, or send an address to, or send an email to election at AITP-NCFL.org. And as I said, we'll send a follow-up email for this to let people know, and the election will be held in excuse me, November, and the installation will be held in December of this year. And the new board will take over starting in January of 2019. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Don Pizzette of IT Pro TV, and he's going to give you a very interesting presentation. All right, thanks for having me, Michael, and uh, thanks everybody for showing up tonight. Uh, what I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about distributed denial of service attacks, and you, you might wonder, like, why did I pick this particular topic? And, uh, and there's a few different reasons. The main reason is that I have a, a special insight into this because uh, I'm an AITP member, I'm a, a board member of our local chapter, so I, I love to participate in our local community. That's a part of it. But I'm also the co-founder of IT Pro TV, and as an online company, we've been subjected to denial of service attacks on more than one occasion. And so we have a, a special insight of being on the receiving end of one of these attacks. And unfortunately, a lot of companies that get attacked, they don't like to talk about it. They, they keep it quiet. They either don't want customers to know about it. They, maybe they paid a ransom to get it to end, and so they don't want people to know that. Maybe there's litigation. There's a, a criminal investigation going on, and they don't want to talk. So we hear about these denial of service attacks all the time, but very few people are sharing the details. What is it like? What, what is it like when somebody's overwhelming your site with traffic and the site goes down? How do you know that you're under a denial of service attack? How do you prevent it? What are some of the steps? So in this presentation, what I want to do is share that information with you all. I, I want to show you how you can spot these things, what you can do, some of the steps, and I'm going to use a real-world example of a distributed denial of service attack that our site underwent a few months ago. Um, this was several months ago that it occurred, and we were able to deflect it. Fortunately, we're, we're an IT company, so we, we are probably a little better off than, than many organizations. No, nope. no organization is immune from a denial of service attack. Much like Michael mentioned, uh, they're very inexpensive to pull off. They can target just about anyone, and they can have a crippling effect. But if you plan for it, if you plan for the type of attack and you put mitigation measures in place, you can actually prevent your system from going down or prevent it from becoming a true problem and issue. But many, many organizations haven't planned for that. And, and in a way, you shouldn't. You, you feel like, I shouldn't have to plan for that. I shouldn't have to plan to be attacked. But that's the reality of providing services on the internet today. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at right here in this presentation. So let's start off with just a couple of basic questions that I, I wanna answer just before I dive into the details on this. 
Uh, first off, you know, what is a DDoS attack? So DDoS stands for Distributed Denial of Service Attack. And these attacks are, are tricky because the way they work is somebody effectively overwhelms your servers. Maybe it's a web server, an email server, a file server. They overwhelm it with traffic, right? Now, that doesn't sound so bad. He's sending a bunch of traffic. I could just stick a filter on the network and block their IP, and that's that. Well, the first D is distributed. Distributed means they're not using one computer. They're not using one IP. They might be using thousands of computers, thousands of IP addresses. That becomes much more difficult to filter. Very, very difficult to block that way. And the traffic itself may look legitimate. It may look like legitimate traffic. They're just requesting your web page. Or they're just clicking the order button or buy button on your shopping cart. That's legitimate traffic. You can't block that, right? You, you won't be able to make money. So by disguising it that way, it becomes incredibly difficult to protect from this type of attack. All right, now, who is doing this? Who causes these attacks? It can be a number of different things. Oftentimes, it's just, it's just people having fun, right? Different kind of fun than what most of us are used to. It, it's, uh, uh, sometimes it's, it's high school kids with a little too much time on their hands. Sometimes it's, it's actual state actors, like nation state, government-sponsored organizations where they're overwhelming sites. But usually, it comes down to various criminal organizations that will point these attacks at a site to bring a site down or to bring a service down and then hold a ransom to get paid to remove it so they actually generate money. But for every one of those that are out there, there's plenty that are just doing it for the fame. Uh, every year at Christmas time, Microsoft's Xbox Live service and Sony's PlayStation Online service both get walloped with denial of service attacks. The first time it happened, they weren't prepared. They didn't know. They didn't know that was going to happen. And there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that opened up brand new Xboxes on Christmas or brand new PlayStations and then couldn't get online to play them because of the denial of service attack. Now, there was no ransom there. Various hacking organizations just did it to show that they could. But then they turned around and started selling that service to other people. Hey, you want me to bring down a website? Pay me a dollar or pay me a, a fee and tell me what website you want me to hit. And they would point their networks at it. So this is a very real thing. This is happening, happening right now. Now, what damage is done? As far as physical damage, next to none. There's hardly, hardly any. In fact, in most cases, there's no physical damage. Uh, as far as, like, breach data, there usually isn't any. So it's pretty benign. But if your service goes down, that creates two big problems, right? You have, first, a public relations issue. Your image is damaged. Your customer sees your site wasn't available. What kind of company can't keep their website up, right? That, that's the impression that the customer gets. The other thing, though, is lost revenue. Take, for example, Amazon.com. Amazon makes money by selling products on their website. I can't walk into an Amazon store and buy something. It's got to be online. If their site went down, a million dollars an hour. They move a million dollars an hour in revenue. Actually, that's two years ago's number, so it's probably higher now. A ton of revenue. That's the real damage that's done. They stop you from doing business. Right? So can they be stopped? Well, that's what this story is all about. So the, the short answer is yes, they can. There's a bit of a technicality there. Like you can't stop somebody from pointing a denial of service attack at you. So I guess you could say no, they can't be stopped. But you can stop your systems from being vulnerable to it. So they can point at you all they want, throw all the traffic they want at you, and your sites can stay online if you plan for it. Right? So the way my story starts is uh, let's set ourselves in time, right? So this is a few months ago. My wife and I had heard about a new restaurant. And so we decided to go. We, we booked some reservations. We went to this restaurant. And we were eating when I got a message on my phone that said the site's down. And I said, all right, well, you know, I'm on my phone. So I, I type in itpro.tv and the site comes up. I can get to it. It's not down for me. So this, this must be one person having a problem. And then a few minutes goes by and someone else tells me, hey, I think the site's down. Check on my phone again. It's up for me. So then I started getting curious, right? We wrapped up dinner. We head back home. So I, I VPN into work. I start checking out things. And the site looks up. But then we started noticing some other things, right? What we were in, we didn't know it then. We were in the very first phase of a denial of service attack, which is detection, right? Detection is how do we even know we're being attacked, right? And if, if it's bad, it'll manifest in your site going down. Right? Or, or whatever your service is, that goes down. It's no longer available. People can't get to it. That's, that's the first phase. you got to spot it. Now, sites can go down for a number of reasons. Right? Maybe, 
Maybe a server crashed. Maybe we lost power. Or maybe our internet connection failed. But in this case, some people could get to the site and some people couldn't. And that's a classic sign of a denial of service attack. The server's being overwhelmed most of the time. Sometimes you can slip in and get a connection. I was on a mobile phone, so it was requesting less data from the web server, so I was getting it. But on a desktop, it was requesting more data and I wasn't getting it. So looking at it from different sides, that started to be a hint. But our biggest hint was when we started looking at the errors that we were getting. Now, we use a web application firewall, a WAF. Now, if you don't have a web application firewall set up for your website, for your web applications that you use, you really should. This is, is becoming something that's really, really essential. When we launched our company, we used a product called WordPress. Uh, at one point, over 40% of websites on the internet were posted on uh, or used the WordPress framework. So very, very common. We don't use it anymore. You kind of outgrew it and had to switch to a new technology. But back then, we leveraged a company called Security. And Security makes a web application firewall specifically for WordPress. All right. We had to move away from them, and I'll talk about it later on, but basically it boiled down to we don't use WordPress anymore. They're designed specifically for WordPress. But if you have a WordPress site, these guys, I think it's like a whopping $20 a month, and they'll stick a firewall in front of your website specifically designed to filter out attacks like these and many, many other attacks that are, that are targeted towards WordPress sites. So some of our viewers were getting this message right here, which is an error message from Security that's basically saying, look, you're okay, talking about the visitor, the security firewall is okay, but the firewall couldn't contact our backend servers. Our backend servers were getting overwhelmed. They were getting overwhelmed with traffic that was hitting them, and it was showing that it was down. Right? This was one of our early hints that there was some kind of a problem going on and it was on our end, and we still didn't know necessarily that it was a denial of service attack. It could have just been a you know, programmer pushed a bad update to the site. It could have been any number of things. So we started taking a look at our usage logs, our, uh, our other resources and activities, and that's where things really started to heat up. All right? So here, knowing the site was down, that was our detection. We noticed that we had some kind of outage that there was a problem. All right? So then we had to move into our second phase, which is identifying the cause. What, what's causing this? Right? Is it our mistake? Is it an attack? Is it whatever? Well, websites are fairly complex these days. It's not just one server running a web page anymore. Now you typically have a front-end web server, a back-end web application, you've got a database that's powering it, and all these different pieces, they all fit together, each one performing a certain role. And if any one of those roles breaks down, the whole thing breaks down, right? So you've got to build in redundancy at every step along the way. We started looking at our systems, and our systems were working. Our, our web front end was working, our, our back ends were working, the databases were working, but they were working harder than normal. And this chart right here really kind of shows it. Um, if I zoom in here, uh, this is our API, our application programming interface. And all of our web calls hit a web server. The web server then talks to our API to get data out of a database. So this is kind of in the middle of every communication. And you'll see over here where it's like normal traffic. Things are chugging along nice and normal. And then all of a sudden, right here, we get walloped. A lot of traffic starts to hit us. Our response time is increasing. Actually, the throughput down here is the extra traffic coming in. What I'm pointing out is the, the response time. When somebody came to our web page before, it would take less than a second to pop up to show the web page. But once the attack started, it was taking over 14 seconds to pull up our web page. If you went to the site, 14 second delay before it came up. Somebody did a study and said if your page loads in over three seconds, most people just move away and go to the next customer, right? Or next uh, website. So we were losing money. Potential customers are trying to come to our site. Site takes too long to load. We're an IT company. Pick, what are they going to teach us about slow loading web pages? Yeah, we'll just move to somewhere else. So now you start to get affected, all right? But just seeing this data here on the back end, that tells us our site's being overloaded. But why? Why is it being overloaded? Maybe it's Black Friday. Then we got a big sale going on, and these are all legit customers coming and trying to buy. Now, that's a problem in and of itself. You can cause your own denial of service attack. You know, if you run a big enough sale, if your, if your video goes viral, uh, you know, maybe you, maybe you came up with just the greatest product idea on the planet, and overnight, everybody wants to buy that product. You can cause a denial of service attack on yourself. A good one, a good, good problem to have. People want to buy your product, right? But your systems need to be able to scale. 
And when you deploy in the cloud, you usually can. You can scale pretty large. But most people, including us, put limits on the scalability. I know that normally our web server runs on about four nodes in our, our cloud system. I, sorry, it's four source nodes. We actually have nodes all over the globe to get the, the website close to people. But the primary application runs on about four nodes. As the site gets more and more active, it'll spawn a fifth node, a sixth node, 10 nodes, 20 nodes, right? To get where it has more horsepower to handle the load. Well, we have a cap set on it. We don't want it to spin too high because every node we spin up costs money. And if you're being attacked, most of that traffic is worthless anyway. You don't want to spin up just to cover that, right? Or if somebody breaks into the site and throws a Bitcoin miner on there or something, you know, you don't want to, to fund that. You should be able to see it far earlier. And that's what we were seeing here is our site was still working. It was just incredibly slow. It was being overwhelmed with traffic. So the question comes then, what kind of traffic are we talking about? On a firewall or whatever monitoring system you have in place, you can look and actually see where the traffic is coming from. And so that's what we did. We went into our web application firewall and we took a look to say, where's this traffic coming from? Most of our customers are in the United States. About 30% of our customers are all around the world. We have some in, in the UK or in Australia, but our product is created in the English language. So most of our customers are in English speaking countries. When I pulled up the heat map to show where traffic was coming into our site, this is what I saw. Okay. Now on security, this heat map is really cool. Like you can pull this up for any site and it shows actively where everybody's connected to your system. A green dart is traffic that was allowed in. A red dart is traffic that was blocked. Security monitors for known attacks and blocks that out. But remember, a distributed denial of service attack, it's crafting a connection that looks legitimate, that's just requesting your web page or uh, requesting an image, hitting a buy button, doing some action that's a normal action. So the team at Security, their automated system, I shouldn't say the team, their automated system sees this traffic and says, eh, it's legit, let it in. It's just regular stuff, right? But I knew quickly looking at this, I, I wish we had a ton of customers down in South America, but we don't, right? Because our content's not in Spanish. But if you look down here, I mean, we are killing it in Brazil, uh, Argentina, Chile. Like we are really doing great, but that's not real. That was a big red flag for us. We've got a lot of traffic coming to the site that's not from places we normally do business. And the traffic is evenly spread across the entire globe, China, Japan, Australia, Russia, the European Union. This is a fairly even distribution. I know Africa doesn't look like it's an even distribution, but you have to remember Africa is really, really big and the cities are much more condensed. So that's actually a pretty good spread. Uh, although I guess you know, we didn't have Egypt and, and some of the Northern African countries, but, but either way, it was a ton of traffic and that was a red flag. There's no sale in the world that we could run. We could make our product free and we wouldn't get a ton of traffic coming in from, from China. You know, that's just not how that system works. So this let us know that we were receiving traffic that we shouldn't be receiving. So we started taking a look at the traffic itself. And again, because we had a firewall in place that the traffic was passing through, then we can look at that. We can see what that traffic looks like. And what we found was some really interesting stuff. So this is actually a, a spreadsheet that I dumped during the attack. So this is some of the real traffic that came in. Um, and, and what you'll see is what's being requested. Now, some of this stuff, like, like there's one example right here in the middle where this IP is trying to get MTA Cloud Fundamentals 98-369. That's one of our courses. That, that's somebody, that's one of our customers coming to view a course and just learn, right? That's what we try and do. We try and teach people, right? But look at all this other traffic. You can probably spot the same pattern that I spotted pretty quick, all right? There's some weird stuff with the rest of the traffic. If you look, most of it is requesting our login page, slash login, right? That's a lot of login traffic, a lot of simultaneous logins on our site, okay? The next red flag is that they're all posts. There's no get. A get is when somebody requests a copy of the web page. If I'm going to log in, what do I do? I get a copy of the login page so I can see it, and then I type in it, and when I hit submit, that's the post. These are thousands of posts with no gets. People are sending logins and never requesting to see the page. That's not normal, 
That's weird. That's, that's not typical traffic, right? This is a red flag. Now, if I didn't understand how these communications worked, I might not notice that. I might think, wow, were we running like a really good show that day? Maybe a lot of people are just trying to log in at once. I like to think that we make one of the best online training products in the world, but we don't have thousands of people logging in at the same time, right? Amazon doesn't have thousands of people logging in at the same time. They have thousands of people shopping at any given time. But logging in simultaneously, that's not normal, right? This is red flag behavior, traffic that you should be able to identify. But it's fairly legitimate. Do people log into our website? All the time, right? We do have dozens of people logging in simultaneously, but not thousands. This is legit, except for the quantity of it, right? The other thing is that these are just logins. They're very small. Just a couple of kilobytes of traffic. It's not, not much. So it's not like somebody needed a massive amount of bandwidth to try and overwhelm our line. Here, it's just a small amount but it's all hitting our login page and it's all generating backend API activity. They're trying to log in, the API has to get involved and the API is getting overwhelmed. Right? The other red flag that I noticed was the operating system that's coming in here. These are, these are the browser agents. Anytime you browse to a website, your web browser is supposed to present what it is. So it'll say, hey, this is Mozilla Firefox or I'm Google Chrome or whatever. We, we see a, a widespread of browsers on our site, but it's usually Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Microsoft Edge, maybe some Opera, a little Vivaldi, right? A couple of the, the weirder, uh, I shouldn't call them weird, but the, you know, the, the fringe browsers that are out there. Um, and some of the, the Firefox derivatives like Pale Moon, you'll see those pop in every now and then. But most of the time, even those identify themselves as Mozilla Firefox, right? Just for compatibility. But these were identifying themselves as Android 5.0 Nexus 4 build LRX21T. Now, Android phones are really, really popular, but Android 5.0 is, it's ancient. Like, if we were to find a buried biblical site that archaeologists, you know, dug down and you found an Android 5 phone, that would be pretty normal. You wouldn't be surprised. That, that's an older phone, right? It's a Nexus 4. That's several generations old. I, I'd be surprised to find a Nexus 4 that's still running right now. Um, better yet, to have Thousands of people on Nexus 4s, all trying to log in at the same time, all using the stock Android browser. Not Chrome, but the stock Android browser. That's just not normal, okay? All of these are identical, identical versions. All of these are identical versions, and yet there's tons and tons of different IP addresses here. This is not one IP address. Because, hey, maybe it's just somebody who's really, really excited about logging in. They're just hammering that login button. These are different IPs. So the odds of this happening are just astronomical. It is not, it's not possible, right? So here's our attack. Okay, here's what's going on. They're attacking us. We're getting tons and tons of login traffic. Now, why? Why, why would we get tons of login traffic? Okay, well, there's two reasons for this. And this is actually, it, it's pretty, pretty clever on the, the side of the attacker. They, they do actually think this stuff through. They, they have a lot of time on their hands, apparently. Um, first off, it's login traffic. It's not like they're just requesting a page. If you request a page, I can send you a copy of it, and it can be a cached copy, cached in RAM on the server, it just gets sent to you, it's no big deal, right? But if you're logging in, I can't cache that. I've gotta process that, because you're typing in a different username and a different password than anybody else. And even if you had already logged in five minutes ago, I still have to run it against the database, because what if you changed your password, right? What if I had a stolen password and I was about to log in and that person already changed their password. I can't, I can't cache that. So this has to be freshly deployed per connection. And that means the server has to work at it. And it means the server has to work hard. They're, they're, they're getting the easy route. They just send a post. They're not even doing a get. They don't get the web page. They don't care about that. They're just sending a post with a username and a password in the right format to send it to our login page. And what's the login page going to do? Well, if it's a bad username and password, it's going to run it against the database. Well, it's got to hash it first. We do all hash passwords, which every website should do. So it's got to take whatever they typed in, and it's got to run a hashing algorithm. That's CPU, right? It's going to consume processor. It has to hash it, and then compare the hash that it generated to a hash that's stored in the database. So now it's got to run a database comparison. It's got to reach out to the database and touch it and then compare. They don't match, all right? Not valid. Now we've got to send a invalid login message. So all they did was a simple post with a username and a password. Meanwhile, 
we had to run hashing algorithms, we had to do database lookups, we had to generate a failed login page and send that back. We had to do a lot of work. That is the perfect denial of service attack. That's the way you want to craft it. The attacker sends the minimal amount of traffic and the victim has to generate a ton of activity as a result. All right. That's what was happening here. Now, one, that's effective, it works. And, and you could pull this type of attack off on any site that has a login form, right? The other side of this though, what they'll do is, you hear about these breaches every now and then, right? Uh, Adobe got breached the other year. Thousands upon thousands of accounts were compromised. Uh, Yahoo, hundreds of thousands of accounts. Uh, you know, many, many high profile companies, many low profile companies, breaches you never even hear about. These breaches occur and usernames and passwords get breached, okay? Well, what's the first thing you do when you get an email that says, uh, you know, maybe it's Adobe and they say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, your account was breached. Here's some free credit monitoring, so I hope you, you feel good about that. Well, the first thing I do, I go and change my password, right? I don't want to use the same password, it's been compromised. Not everybody does that, right? Or people use the same password on more than one site. People say, hey, I, I got this password, it's really complex, really hard but I'm gonna use it on 50 different sites. Well, if one of those sites gets compromised, that password can now be used on the other 49, if the attacker knows about it. So what they can do is they can go out and get these breach databases, which you can, you can download. There's five minutes of work on Google, and you can get one of these breach databases that has a list of user credentials that are from some prior breach. It probably won't work on the site that was breached. But they can take that database and use it to fuel their denial of service attack and point it at somebody like us. And now they can throw those usernames and passwords in there and they don't really care if they work or not, right? If they don't work, it creates a denial of service on us. It can bring the site down and it can make us look bad. If they do work, holy moly, they just found valid user credentials. And think about our customer base, right? Um, we're IT Pro TV. We do training for systems administrators, for developers, for people that work for IT companies that handle financial data, medical data, and we don't have that ourselves, but our customers do. And so if they can find a valid username and password for one of our customers, now they've got a, uh, a, a springboard, right? A, you know, they can leapfrog and use that to do a better, uh, like a social engineering attack or something like that against somebody. They can actually leverage that pretty effectively. So that's kind of a double benefit. They, and they don't really care if they hit a, a valid name or not, but if they do, it's like icing on the cake. Right? So this type of attack is really, really well crafted to benefit the attacker, which makes a whole lot of sense. All right? So for us, what do we do? Well, now we knew we were being attacked. We knew how we were being attacked. We knew what they were doing, and we knew why they were doing it. Right? There's no ransom here. They weren't sending a ransom to us. I mean, maybe, maybe they were, and we just ignored it. I don't know. Because when they send a ransom, maybe they email it, maybe they send it some other means, but no, none of us got it. So if, if they did send a ransom, we didn't see it. Um, if you're watching the video, sorry, uh, you know, use a different email. But, um, but we still had to do something about it, right? The problem is we were in a hurry, all right? You're being attacked. The site is not down, but not healthy either. It's taking a long time for people to get the page. It's embarrassing. So you need to do something quickly. Now, if you've not planned for this attack, you can't do anything quickly. It's not possible. You can't put a firewall rule in place. What, what am I gonna block? Thousands of IPs, right? This spreadsheet, um, this is actually an image of the spreadsheet, so I don't have the spreadsheet pulled up itself. Uh, it actually had over 2,000 records in it, and it was just two seconds of activity. Um, or no, actually this one was a little bit longer. I think this one was, was this a solid minute of activity? This might've been a solid minute of activity if I remember right. but. It was a ton of IPs. You can't create firewall rules fast enough. It's not effective. I can't block the login page. <laughs> I kind of need the login page, right? So if you haven't planned for any of this, there is no immediate action you can take to make it stop. You have to wait it out. Eventually, they'll stop, and that's not a viable solution. So that's another kind of side reason why I wanted to do this talk is if you're not being attacked right now, perfect. Now's the time to act. You need to get in and put some protection in place even something as low cost, like, like the security product that I was showing a moment ago, we're 20 bucks a month, right? Uh, they can become far more advanced than that, far more expensive and far more powerful. But as a temporary solution, security actually gave us a solution for this. And they said, look, we can't filter individual traffic like that. It's, it's just too much, right? But what we can do 
is we can implement something that will temporarily solve the problem. So that was phase three for us, implement a temporary solution. That temporary solution for us, something that you all will recognize and you probably all hate, but boy, does it serve a purpose, a CAPTCHA, right? We immediately enabled a CAPTCHA for our site. If you came to our website during the attack, and maybe some of you out there uh, did, if you came to our site during the attack, you might not have even known an attack was occurring. You just thought it was weird. Huh, I went to their site, and I immediately got a CAPTCHA. What's that all about, right? But you answered the CAPTCHA. Here it's you know, displaying two words. I just type the two words out, and I, I type click to proceed, and I get logged in, and now I'm accessing the site, right? And everything's working fine. Well, the attacker that's hitting the login page, remember, they're not doing a get request. So they're not getting a copy of the page at all. They're just doing a post. So when the CAPTCHA is presented, they don't even see it. They don't see it and they're blocked and that traffic gets stopped at security, never even made it to our servers, right? As soon as we put that CAPTCHA in place, our website changed. It changed a lot. That map from a moment ago where it was all green arrows, wasn't green arrows anymore. Lots and lots of red. And this was a lot more what we're used to seeing, okay? We've got tons of green arrows in the United States. That's where most of our customers are. We have green arrows down in Australia, a lot of Australian members. We have green arrows in Europe, in, in the UK, France, Spain, a lot of English speakers in that area, we've got green arrows. But just about everywhere else, especially South America, where, again, I, I wish we had a lot of customers down there, but we just don't create Spanish-speaking content, all of those systems that were down there were fraudulent. It was all attack traffic that was being sent to us, and now it was being blocked. And as soon as that was being blocked, our site went back to normal. Uh, our API usage all dropped back to normal. Everything was good, all right? But this is a temporary solution, right? I say it's temporary because it's not a good user experience to go to somebody's website and immediately be presented with a CAPTCHA, right? Immediately, I'm gonna say, I don't trust you. You wanna see my site? You gotta prove who you are. That, that's, not, that's not what you expect. And when I type CNN.com, I expect to get CNN. I don't expect to get a CAPTCHA. And, and especially if you're a business, you're trying to generate a good relationship with your customer, you're trying to take care of your members, you wanna tell them from day one, hey, I, I trust you until you do something bad, right? You don't wanna start it the other way around, like I don't trust you, it's up to you to prove yourself. That, that's not the way to do business, all right? So this was our temporary solution. It got us back up and going. Because we had that web application firewall in place, this was like two check marks that I had to click and the problem went away. The attack, the attack actually lasted for about six hours, but our site performance issues from start to finish lasted, I don't know, about 30 minutes maybe? Uh, mostly because I had to drive from the restaurant to get home, uh, and that, that, that time factors in. Uh, but the overall solution here was pretty easy. If we didn't have that firewall in place, we would have had to have, one, figured out what a web application firewall was, right? Found a service, bought it, added our site to it, and then changed our DNS record to point to the firewall instead of our regular site. Now that DNS change, it could take five minutes, it could take 48 hours, right? DNS cache maxes out at 48 hours, and there's plenty of countries that max out like that. Meanwhile, these attacks are likely being pointed directly at our old IP anyway. So just routing new people through the new range the old people, the attackers, would still be pointed at the old. It really wouldn't help. It, it would be a problem. You'd have to wait it out, and it might be days. Most of us in this online age can't afford for your site to be down for days. That's not realistic. And some people can, right? It depends on your industry and, and what you're doing. But a lot of us need that website to be up every single day. So this is a, a big, big problem. So we need something a little more permanent. But now I have breathing room. My, my first concern was, let's get the site back online. We're back online, right? Everything's back up. It's not ideal, but it's up, right? Then I sat down and went into research mode. And I said, all right, what are all these machines that are attacking us? They're not Android phones. That's crazy talk, right? So, so what are these machines that are attacking us? So I just picked an IP at random and uh, started researching it, right? Some people call this hacking back. That's not really a fair term. If you attack the IP, then yeah, you're hacking back, and that's not actually legal in, in most places. Mostly because the victims here, they are the people that are attacking you, 
these are just compromised machines. They're not actually attacking you. There's, there is a bad guy back there somewhere, but you don't see their IP in your log. So if you attack one of these addresses, it's not them. And we found that out right away. When I started looking at one of the IPs, I browsed to it, and what was it? It was a Samsung security video system that a company, and they were in, uh, I believe it was in Poland, uh, this particular one. Uh, it was in Poland, and some store or somebody's home, they had a security system that had cameras through their home or office, and it had been compromised. Attackers had gotten into it. This is an Internet of Things type device, right? We see this a lot. Webcams, digital video recorders, these systems, we plug them into our network, and then we forget about them. We never update them. We don't even think twice about them. They're just there. And a lot of them are developed by companies that are companies we've never heard of. You know, small uh, factories in China that this is their first device they've made. They're not very well secured. But sometimes they're big. This one's Samsung. We've heard of Samsung, right? They make a lot of technology, a lot of hardware. But even Samsung can't force you, the customer, to update your device. And that's what these were. Thousands of them. I, I got bored after about 20 or 30 of them, and I stopped looking, but the majority of them were video recorders like this. A couple of them were routers. Uh, there were routers that have been compromised. People don't think twice about what the router is doing at any given time. As long as their wireless works and they get to Facebook, they don't care. Meanwhile, their router is sending out all sorts of crazy traffic. So we found some really interesting things. Zero point in reaching out to these people. If I were to try it, well, first off, I don't speak Polish, so there, there's a problem. Uh, but if I were to reach out to these people, they don't necessarily know the system is compromised. For some random American to call and say, hey, I think your video recorder is compromised, what are they going to think? Oh, this is a phishing attack or something, you know, some kind of social engineering. So you're not going to get anywhere with that. It, it's just, there's no point, okay? So what you have to do from here is say, all right, I, I can't fix these machines. These machines are, are just too far, too far gone but I can't keep blocking my legitimate customers. I need something that can fix this problem. Right? Now, I mentioned how we used to run WordPress. And when we ran WordPress, Securi was an amazing service for us. They really understand WordPress. They have inline filters and rules that block most attacks before they even reach your system. But as our company grew, we outgrew WordPress. It just, it, we, couldn't, we couldn't carry our workload on that platform. And so we moved away to something developed in-house. We have a custom system, a learning management system that we built uh, just, just for us. We're the only people on the planet that run this one LMS. So we're not going to find some service out there that says, oh, yeah, we provide uh, protection for IT Pro TV's LMS. That, that's not going to happen, right? So we needed something that was a little more powerful and a little more flexible. We were covered for right now, but I needed something that could take care of this. And so I started doing some research on some options that were out there, and we came across, uh, we were considered the market leader in web application firewalls, a company called Encapsula. And Encapsula, they, uh, they make a product that is a web application firewall, and it is very powerful. But when you deploy it out of the box, it actually doesn't do anything, it doesn't filter anything. Because they say, look, we don't know your website. You know your website, not us. So what we do is we give you the tools to protect your website. You understand it. We don't. And so when I signed us up for them and shifted our service over to that, I was able to go in and write custom rules, custom rules that did work for IT Pro TV's LMS because we do know it, right? And I'm saying I, like I did all this work. We actually have a staff of like eight developers, and they did a lot of this work too. So I don't want to take all the credit for that. Um, I did the initial stuff, the initial let's get us up and running and once we had breathing room, that's when we incorporated the rest of the teams and we all came up with this solution. It's more than what one person can handle, even for small companies. You, you need help and you shouldn't be afraid to ask for help because it, it, it's a daunting task. But you'll see with them, they had the option to do what are called protected pages, where I could come in and I could say, I want to protect just one page. I don't want to put a CAPTCHA on the whole site. Let's just put a CAPTCHA on one page, right? And so you could do that. And, and they have where you can do password protection, CAPTCHA challenge, two-factor authentication with Google. You got to have one of those uh, um, uh, the one-time passwords, the ra rapidly changing passwords. Or IP address restrictions, we can limit it there, right? But this is still not a great experience for our customer, right? You don't want a customer to come to your website and say, oh, I'm already paying you money. I want to log in. Oh, here's a CAPTCHA. Great, you don't trust me. I've already paid you money, and now you don't trust me? Still not a great experience, right? But where the real power comes in here is if you understand your attack, they have 
where you can write custom rules. And this turned out to be a one-liner for us that solved every problem we had, which was the login page is what was being attacked. And so I wrote a rule, and I, I actually did write this rule, uh, where I basically said, when a connection comes in for our login page, require JavaScript support. Test the browser to see if it supports JavaScript. When attackers are attacking you, they're just doing those posts, right? And the post request, they're just sending it, they're not responding at all. So when you do a query to see if they test JavaScript, you never get an answer back. It doesn't work. And so we're able to detect and filter that traffic out without popping up a CAPTCHA. You can test without even letting the other person see it. So a regular user could come to our site and go to our login page, and they'll get tested for JavaScript. A regular user will have JavaScript, right? Most of us have that on in our web browser. It's no big deal. They get tested. If they pass, then they come right in, right? If they don't pass, they get a CAPTCHA. Well, again, attackers aren't going to deal with it. And if a regular end user has turned off JavaScript, they'll get a CAPTCHA. And the odds are they're getting CAPTCHAs at a lot of websites they visit because we're not the only people doing this. This is a standard technique used by most companies these days. Normal people have JavaScript enabled. Most websites these days rely upon that to render things. So we're able to test for that. Now, we did have to exclude some things. You'll see that uh, uh, browser and search bot exclusion. If they're using a, an actual interactive browser or if it's a search bot like Google, we want Google to be able to index our site. Now, this is our login page. I don't actually care if Google indexes our login page or not, but we can filter that out and then make sure that it's legitimate traffic coming in. Once that's done, we put that in place. This is far less invasive. For an average user that comes to our site, they never even see this. They come to the site, they go to the login page, they log in, all this is in the background. For an attacker, it blocks them. And once we put this in place, I checked, and sure enough, we were still getting the same filtering results. The attack was still ongoing. Through this whole process, the attack is ongoing, but it's no longer affecting the customers. Remember what I said at the beginning of the presentation, can we stop the attack? Yes and no. Yes, we can stop the attack from affecting us and affecting our customers. No, we can't actually stop the attack. For a period of about 12 hours, this traffic was coming in. We were getting flooded with thousands of login requests for a long time. But it wasn't affecting us. We didn't care. I, I don't care. It could be running today, uh, you know, for weeks, months. It'd be fine. It's just wasting their resources. And so what happened? After 12 hours, sure enough, all the traffic stopped. It stopped because they just move on to attack somebody else, right? This is not a personal thing. There wasn't somebody out there who said, oh, I hate IT Pro TV. I mean, you know, maybe there's somebody somewhere. But in this case, it was just some random thing, and they just move on to lower hanging fruit, right? Somebody who doesn't have tools in place to stop it or doesn't have staff, doesn't have uh, people who are performing that role. And sadly, what I just described is most companies. Most companies don't have actual full-time IT security personnel. That's still a budding area of industry. If you're a small or medium business, odds are you don't have a chief information security officer and a, uh, a security auditor. You don't have that. Maybe you contract it, which is great. You should certainly do that, but you probably don't have somebody full-time. Right? If you're in the enterprise space, you should. You should have staff. You should have more than one. Uh, people that are auditing your systems, looking for attacks, people who understand your traffic, so they can spot when an attack is coming in like this. That's really important to make sure that, uh, that you're protecting your systems, that you're, you're prepared when an attack like this occurs. Because it's not if the attack occurs. That's how it used to be. Now it's when. This stuff is, is just randomly moving across the internet, going IP to IP or site to site. And you, you will get hit eventually. And it's nothing personal. It might not even be a ransom. It might be they're just trying to validate a user database. They just want to find out what passwords are good. They don't... They don't care about you and your business. They don't want Bitcoin. They just are trying to compromise this user database. It could be any number of things. So you've got to be prepared for it, right? And I'm, I work for IT Pro TV. I don't work for any web application firewalls that are out there. But they're all kind of doing the same thing. They're all allowing you to filter traffic before it hits your site. And that's really important. Um, Encapsula is a big one. You've got, um, uh, well, Security that I mentioned. There's several other vendors like F5 that have them. Amazon Web Services actually has a built-in WAF or web application firewall that's a part of AWS now. You can deploy it right alongside your other AWS resources. So this is now a very commonplace technology. 
that everybody should have in place, even if you don't configure rules for it. If you just stick it in there with no rules, right? Now you might say, well, why the heck would I do that? That way, when an attack does occur, you've already got it in place so you can go and put rules in. It gives you the tool to be able to stop that traffic from coming in. So maybe you're pressed for time right now. I don't have time to figure out all the legit traffic on my side and map rules for it. Okay, at least put the WAF in place and just let it pass all the traffic, right? And then that way, you'll have the way to be able to step in and put that gate in to stop that traffic from coming in. You know, a lot of people think of denial of service attacks as volumetric attacks, where they try and overwhelm you with bandwidth. Those don't really happen anymore. They, I mean, there have been some record setters in this last year where people are just trying to prove a point. Uh, somebody moved a little over three terabytes of traffic. Uh, this three terabytes of simultaneous traffic uh, in a DOS attack last year. Now, that's cool. I mean, for them, I guess. Uh, they hit some new record. But it's really hard to pull off. It's really hard to compromise enough machines to generate that level of attack and then point it at a single point. It's very difficult to do. The traffic that I'm showing you here it never broke more than, I think we might have hit two megabit, uh, megabit at one point. I think that was the maximum. That's not a lot, right? I'm, I've got gigabit internet at home. And, and this is a, a cloud-based site here. We have terabits of, of bandwidth. If you're in AWS, you've got tons, right? So it's not volumetric. You can't spot it on bandwidth anymore. It's all about wasting resources. That's how distributed denial of service attacks work and how they're effective today. So the last phase, and this is the phase a lot of people skip, and I think it's really important, so I want to mention here, is when you solve a problem like this, it's nice to go, Whew, all right, done with that, I'm going to go relax, have a beer, right? But you should write down what you learned. What did you learn by doing this? What could we have done to have prevented this in the first place, right? And there were mistakes. We made mistakes, certainly. And, and now that we know better, we cannot make them, and hopefully you won't make them. But what we found was that we really needed to have a better understanding of what our normal traffic looked like. Okay, here's a snapshot of our traffic at peak time. So at our peak usage on our site. You'll see we have a lot of European users. We do actually have somebody down there in South America, right? That's legit traffic down there in South America, uh, Hawaii, right? But there's some red, right? Those are attacks that come in, just regular type of attacks that it almost feels weird saying that. It's just regular old attacks, right? We ignore those. Um, but that's what our normal traffic looks like. If you know what your normal traffic looks like, it's really easy to spot when you've got abnormal traffic. But what if I didn't know that? If I didn't know what my normal traffic looks like, I might think, oh, yeah, hey, look, we got customers all over the place, right? So one, we needed better documentation on what our normal traffic looked like. We had tribal knowledge. Like I, I knew just because I've been with the company since day one, so I knew what our traffic looked like. But if I hadn't been there, Somebody who was hired two weeks ago might not know what our normal traffic looks like. So we need to make sure we have better baselines, that we understand what that is going to look like. All right. Some of the other things, uh, automated responses. Our initial response was a manual one. We got reports that the site was performing poorly, that the site was down for some people. And I had to manually turn on that CAPTCHA. Well, you know what? We should have been able to automate that. Services like what we now have within Capsula, it is automated. I don't get a call anymore. We've undergone like four more of these attacks since this one. This one happened, um, I think, about four months ago. Uh, we've had several more occur since then. But I, I've never gotten a phone call. I, I just see them in the logs. I look in the logs, and I'm like, oh, yeah, look, we got attacked yesterday. Nobody noticed because it was all stopped, right? Designing automated responses are really important. WAFs are critical, web application firewalls. And, and I'm focused on web apps in this, this kind of presentation here. But this goes for mail servers and file servers that you're not going to use a web application firewall, but you're going to use a similar technology that's designed to protect your mail server, that's designed to protect those other systems. But the reality is most DDoS attacks are focused on websites. That's the, the public presence that companies create. That's what they're focused on. Right? And then the last one, this is one that we really should have, have paid. This is probably our biggest failing. Know when you outgrow your solution. We outgrew security. I will tell you right now that hands down, they are a great product. They're great people. I've met both the owners, uh, the founders of, of security. Uh, it's a wonderful product. If you run a WordPress site, you really should look into it. Uh, can't speak highly enough about it. But the moment we moved away from WordPress, we should have moved away from security. But we didn't. We had this rapport with them. We'd used them for years. We, we loved that product. It was, it was kind of hard to, it was hard to say goodbye, right? But, but there does come a point where you have to say, that's just not the right fit for us anymore. And we had to move to a new system. 
And so we moved over to Encapsula, and eventually we'll probably move over to AWS's WAF uh, from there. We'll, we'll see where that goes. But we should have known that. That, that was our mistake. That, that was a, a problem that could have been avoided. If you implement a solution, it might be right for today. It might be wrong for tomorrow, right? We always have to think about that. Technology moves and changes so fast that it just it, it gets out of hand, and, and before you know it, you've got the wrong solution in place to protect your system. So that, that was probably our biggest failing there. But now, now we plan for that, right? We, we learned our lesson. We, we make sure we take steps and we improve our service. That's always a part of what companies should be doing, right? Continual process improvement, CPI. All right, so that's kind of my story. And uh, I tried to share as many details as I could. Uh, I'm, we have no secrets on this stuff. Uh, most of it that I showed here is kind of cool because you actually get to see how that attack worked and how we were able to stop it. Uh, but I want to open the floor for questions in case anybody has uh, something that I left out or, or wants more information. We kind of field that, and uh, hopefully everybody can kind of benefit and learn. All right, so we have any questions from the audience? Don, I want to thank you very, very much for the presentation. Very informative and uh, the best, the best uh, explanation I've had of what a DDoS is and you know what to do about it. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned some of the uh, various commercial products that work. Have you heard of something called Cloudflare? Do you know oh, if yes. that's similar? Yep. Uh, so Cloudflare, if you want to defend your website, especially from volumetric attacks, I, I think there's only like one other company in the world that has more bandwidth than Cloudflare. They are, are very, very powerful for that. And they actually actively monitor the internet for DDoS attacks that are pointed at other sites and put protections on yours to make sure that if that attack gets moved to point to you, you're already protected. So they're a good service for that. There are some limitations with Cloudflare that make it a little hard to implement. So let me, let me make sure I, I, I kind of give all the details here. Uh, one, uh, they're a good company. So, uh, well, some people don't think so because they protect, they protect sites that we morally agree with and they protect sites that we morally disagree with. So if we, if we set politics and, and religion and all that aside, from a technology standpoint, they have a great technology and they can certainly keep your site online. Right? Personally, I don't use Cloudflare for anything. And the main reason is that to truly protect your site, you have to host your DNS zones with them. That if you've got a DNS domain that you're trying to protect, part of their protection scheme is they manage your DNS. It's so they can shift out your IP, they can move you to different load balancers. It's part of the protection, right? It makes a lot of sense. That's, that's part of their product and it's why they're effective, right? But for us, we do a lot of cloud deployment. We do, um, uh, like with AWS, we do Terraform. So like our website, uh, if, if something happened to our website, if it was defaced, we can click a button and everything gets blown away and everything gets redeployed fresh and clean in a matter of seconds, right? Terraform lets us do that. Well, Terraform has to control our DNS zones. But Cloudflare has to control our DNS zones. So if you want to deploy it, they've got this crazy workaround that has all these delegated domains and all this mess. It becomes really complex and messy, and that's a challenge for me. And so we usually end up deploying a, a, other technologies. And, and when I say we, I mean like us with IT Pro TV, but also other companies that I've, I've worked with and helped and, and pushed through this. So if you want to work with Cloudflare, they're reasonably priced, they have a great product, and if you don't mind transferring your DNS zones over, and I don't mean transferring ownership, I just mean where they're actually being hosted, uh, then it's a great service and it works. That is an extra little caveat you want to be aware of. And there's also some issues related to uh, Western Express, uh, Western Java certificate. If you split, I'm sorry, if you split some of the, the domain DNS services, the uh, certificates won't renew. We ran into that the other day with a yep. very old Cloudflare that uh, we didn't realize we still had. All right, so so Let's Encrypt um, is a great way to get free certificates, right? Uh, they force, I think the maximum age on them is three months, so they force renewals very, very rapidly, which makes them more secure, so it's great technology. But one of the problems you bump into is how Let's Encrypt's auto-renew works. When it auto-renews, the Let's Encrypt servers need to know that you're generating a certificate from the server that this is being run on. But when they look at it from their end, they don't see your server. They see the WAF. And because of that, they'll fail to issue the cert. And Let's Encrypt is not really good about supporting other forms of validation. If they did, then this wouldn't be a problem. But it is something that you'll bump into. Most of the WAFs uh, will actually let you generate the Let's Encrypt certificate on the WAF itself. And that kind of solves that problem, but you still need a back-end certificate. I recommend 
well, I recommend a few different things. It's based on the scenario. But usually, we do extended verification certificates. And you can't do those with Let's Encrypt yet. So you end up generating your own custom certs, and it's not a problem. But if you're relying on Let's Encrypt, web application firewalls can make that a little more complex. Right? All right, do we have any other questions? of the um, sources of these external attacks were um, basically unpatched um, Internet of Things. That seems like it's going to be a larger problem as the Internet of Things grows rather than a smaller one. Um, what's the solution to start thinking about getting people to patch their oh my goodness. It, Internet devices? If, if I can answer that question, I would have so much money right now. It would be ridiculous. Um, it's, a big, it's a big problem, right? And, and let me tell you a story that I, I ran into just myself. Uh, at home, I had a little um, PTZ camera, right? A, a little webcam. We, we called it our nanny cam. It was by Foscam, F-O-S-C-A-M. You can go on Amazon, and they have tons of models that are out there. And it used to sit on top of the entertainment center in our living room. And when we were on trips or whatever, I could pull up that camera, and I could see the living room. I could pan and tilt, and I could talk into it. And, you know, it was just a great way to do basic surveillance of your home. Well, a exploit came out for that camera, a remote exploit that that camera used a peer-to-peer -peer network to be able to find the Foscam servers so that your mobile app could then find it. Well, that was opening up a little tunnel to the web, and attackers could take advantage of that to be able to get into your camera remotely. And once they were into your camera, they could do two things. So one, they could watch you, which is creepy. Uh, but two, they could turn it into an attack node, which is what we were being hit by in our denial of service attack, right? So how do you fix it? Well, I'm an IT guy, right? So what do I do? I go to the Foscam website, and I go to get the firmware, and they haven't patched it. And a couple of days went by, and they haven't patched it. Now I have a firewall at home. I have just a simple, like a PFSense firewall. So I have rules that are blocking it. I, I sever the peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer connection that it had. So that, that's broken off. So I can't, I can't be attacked with this vector anymore. But if I want to see my camera, now I have to VPN in home to see it. Right? And that, that's not any fun. And so I wait. A week goes by. A month goes by. And they still haven't patched it. So finally, I took that camera, and I brought. I actually have it in my office here, not plugged in. I use it on the security shows. Here's how you break into a camera. So, so I use it for that. It's a good lesson um, for me to use in, in the shows. Uh, and I had to replace my camera. I had to buy a different camera uh, from a, a different company that is updating theirs. And to this day, this was a year ago, they still haven't patched that exploit. That, that exploit is still there. And that's a problem with Internet of Things devices. A lot of them are made to be as inexpensive as possible, just cheap, cheap, cheap. And you get what you pay for. And they're just not secured. And if you don't give them internet access, they're actually safe, right? But they mostly have internet access these days. And that's, that's a big problem. That's where we get uh, compromises like these where uh, you know, homes are vulnerable and people, people don't even know it. All right, well, I think uh, that's probably our, our last question we'll be able to take. Or do we have another one? Oh. OK. <laughs> Don, I want to thank you for a fantastic presentation. It was very interesting, and as Steve said, it's about as clearly as you can explain a complex entity like a distributed denial of service attack. I'd um, like to go ahead and start closing the meeting. Our next presenter will be Tony Barr, one of the co-inventors of the programming language SAS. He will be speaking on programming and the language of thought. I cannot wait for that. I've seen parts of this. He's evolving the presentation. It's going to be wonderful. If you're interested in joining AITP, please come to our website, aitp-ncfl.org. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons you'd want to be part of this organization. It's a lot of fun. It's been around since 1971. In fact, this would be our, what, 17th, 47th uh, anniversary? 48th? 47th, yes, yes. We've been around for a long time. Um, it's great networking. It's great camaraderie. It's great entertainment. It's great education. You'll love it. It's a lot of fun. Again, if you're interested in um, applying for a board position, if you're a member, um, just send an email to election at aitp-ncfl.org. With that, thank you very much. Thank you to our um, guests for coming out, and we'll see you next time.